This is video number five from Digital Dash University. Um, we're considering various topics in quantum mechanics, and in this video, we want to introduce what Hermitian operators are. In the previous video, we had defined the uh, adjoint of an operator. This was the standard definition, and we pretty much covered what all that entails in the previous uh, video. But one of the outcomes of this was is that if we have then the linear operator in matrix form, then this is how it's related to its adjoint. We take the complex conjugate of it, and we also interchange the rows and the columns. So, for example, if L was, say, the L operator was this matrix here, then we would go along, go down the first column, take the complex conjugate of these numbers, then that would be the first row in the adjoint, in its complex adjoint. 13 minus i minus 5i. Same thing for this column. Take the complex conjugates, 3 minus i, 21 plus i, and then that complex conjugate of that column becomes this row here. And likewise for the third column. Take the complex conjugates, and now that becomes the third row here. And the reason why, of course, is because the m and the n's here are interchanged, and as we explained, I think it was in the second video, that the inner number represents the row, that represents the column when the, when the linear operator is in matrix form. So the rows and the columns get exchanged, or as they would say in linear algebra, they get transposed. So the classical adjoint is the transpose of the operator, plus you take the complex conjugate. Now having said all that, let's ask this question. Is it possible for a linear operator to equal its own uh, complex conjugate? And let's see if, if that is true, what properties would the linear operator have to express in order for that to be true? Let's just go back here to our definition only instead of taking the inner product of our linear operator with ket vector a and then with the bra vector b, let's just have it with ket vector a and bra vector a. So we'd have it like this. And this is equal to its adjoint, and here we would have it would be like this. But now, if this is equal to, if the linear operator equals its adjoint, then this just, we remove this, and we have this expression. So what this is saying now is that this equals its own complex conjugate. Well, the only way that can happen is if you have real numbers. Now, if we have a plus ib, then its complex conjugate, of course, is a minus ib. What we're saying here is a plus ib equals the complex conjugate of a plus ib. What we're saying this is equal to its own complex conjugate. That doesn't make any sense because the complex conjugate of this is a minus ib, not a plus ib. But if we take this away, well, the complex conjugate of a real number is just the real number. So this then means that if a linear operator equals its adjoint, then if you take the inner product of the inner operator 
with the cap vector a, and then whatever that is, multiply that by the bra vector a, that has to equal this, or that has to be a real number. Well, instead of doing it with just some um, cat and bra vector, let's go back then and do it with a, uh, uh, a basis vector. So if we have, say like this, we're saying that has to be a real number then. Well, what that means now, this would be the matrix representation the linear operators L, its matrix representation would be this. So what that means is that for the matrix expression of our linear operator, the diagonal elements have to be real. This has to be a real number. And when you have a matrix, whenever the row and the column are the same number, then you're on a diagonal. A11, A22, A33, and so forth. So what this means is that if a linear operator is equal to its own uh, adjoint, then when it's in matrix form, the diagonals of the matrix had to be real numbers. Now the other components of the matrix, they can be complex numbers, but we still have this relationship. So the other numbers in the matrix have to be complex conjugates of each other. And not just the other numbers in the matrix, but actually the off diagonal elements have to be complex conjugates of each other. Let's just illustrate this with an example. Here we had a matrix, and this was its adjoint. Now let's consider this matrix. If we can get into better focus. Okay, let's look at this matrix. The diagonals are real numbers. Now, here we have, let's take the first row, take its complex conjugate, 2 minus i, 6 minus i. Sorry, this is the first column. Now, in its adjoint, that's going to be the first row with the complex conjugate of these. So we're going to have 3, 2 minus i, 6 minus i. There they are. But that's the same thing as the first row and the original matrix. Likewise, we proceed along here. The second column, we take the complex conjugate, becomes the second row in the adjoint matrix. So I have 2 plus i and 11 minus i right here. But that's already equal to the column in the original matrix. And same thing for this third row. This would be 6 plus i or this third column, excuse me, this would be 6 plus i and 11 plus i. That becomes the third row, 6 plus i, 11 plus i, 8. That's already the third row in the original matrix. And the reason why it turns out like that is two reasons. First of all, the diagonals are real numbers, so you don't have to worry about complex conjugates. And here, we remember we had the relationship TMN and TNM had to be complex conjugates of each other. So what we have is this is 2, 1, that second row, first column. Here we have 1, 2, and they're complex conjugates of each other. This is 3, 1, third row, first column. This is 1, 3 first row, third column, and indeed they are complex conjugates of each other. Same thing for here. So what it means is that an operator can be equal to its own adjoint. It has to have special properties, as you can see. It has to have a special construction in matrix form. And those types of operators then that have this special characteristics, we call those Hermitian operators. And Hermitian operators play an extremely important role in quantum mechanics. And we'll explain more of the uh, properties of Hermitian operators in the uh, our next video. What we want to do, though, is just 
to stop and introduce a few more concepts at this point. So, so far we have the definition for the adjoint of an operator, or what that would look like in matrix form, and then we found out that there can be some operators where it is equal to its own complex, or its own adjoint, and those are called permission operators. Now, let's say that we have, we're going to switch gears here now, let's say that we have a particular operator, um, we can call it, say, operator C, and let's say it operates on a particular ket vector, say A, and instead of making say a new type of ket vector, uh, say P, that doesn't happen. Instead, when it operates on the ket vector, all we get is just some constant times that ket vector. So it didn't really make a new ket vector, it just took the original one and multiplied it by a constant. And this, we would say, is the eigenvalue of that operator. Or in quantum mechanics, we don't just use vectors, we use functions. We would say that this is an eigenfunction of this operator. So that when the operator operates on this, whatever type of operation it is, differentiation or whatever, all you end up with is, is just some constant times that original eigenfunction. In matrices, in linear algebra, we would say that you have a matrix C operating, say, on a column vector A. And when you do that, do the multiplication, and again, how, how this multiplication is performed, uh, we discussed that, I think it was in video number three, and all you end up with then is just some constant times this that column vector, then this is called an eigenvector of the matrix, and that's called the eigenvalue of the matrix. And we're not going to, in this series, we're not going to discuss how you find the eigenvalues and the eigenfunctions of a particular matrix, but to see more details on that, if you can go to the website at digital-university.org, and click on Linear Algebra, I think it's videos 15 and 16 where we discuss specifically and we have examples of how to find the eigenvalues and the eigenfunctions of a uh, particular matrix. Also, I might warn you though that in that videos we talk a lot about the null space of a matrix and the lead variables and the free variables and if you're viewing make the uh, videos 15 and 16 in the Literary Algebra series, you're not certain of what we're referring to, look back on the uh, earlier videos in that series and we cover all those topics there. Okay, that's all we want to say right now on this particular video. Um, it turns out that for permission matrices, If you have a Hermitian or a Hermitian operator operating on a certain ket vector, and all you end up with is some constant times that ket vector, it turns out that for Hermitian operators, the eigenvalues have a special property, and so do these eigenfunctions. And those we will discuss in the next vi in the uh, next video. Uh, we'll not only discuss what they are, but we'll derive what they are. And we're taking a separate video to go through that because we want to try to do it carefully because they have monumental importance in quantum mechanics. So come back, transfer the next video, and we'll discuss some of the other special properties of permission operators.